Hey guys, this is Fight Right, a writer's resource writing fight scenes, action, and violence. I'm Carla, and today I'm going to break down the Joe Steph video that I've had posted for quite some time now. I was asked recently by Arista Henry, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, via YouTube if I could go over uh, quarterstaff stuff. And I mentioned that I had a Joe Staff video, but I never considered that if you don't really have experience with a staff, then you may not understand what it is you're seeing. So I'm going to break down that Joe Staff kata so you can see what's offensive, what's defensive, and what's transitional. A quarter staff and a bow staff are basically, I mean, they're basically the same thing. If you handle them differently, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, it's called quarter staffs are basically the European version of the bow staff, and it's called a quarter staff because they made it after cutting um, a, um, wood into quarters. So it was it was that length. I think it ended up being they're about six feet long. A Joe staff is shorter than a bow staff. Ideally, um, a Joe staff should come right up to about your shoulder, and um, the Joe staff video today. Um, that's where it is. Okay, so let's take a look at this video. This is my former Aikido sensei, Sensei um, Hinato. He is at Haru Dojo, H-A-R-U, in the Woodlands, Texas. If you are ever in the Woodlands, Texas, and you want to get some Aikido in under your belt, definitely go to Haru Dojo. Okay, this is Joe Kata. Again, this is a Joe staff. It's shorter, but you have the same concept. Um, Joe staff uh, kata number 13. Okay, a kata is just a collection of fight moves that are put together and you memorize them. And it the concept is it helps you understand what moves can reasonably flow together. Does it mean that when you get into um, an altercation that these are the absolute steps you must take? Absolutely not. But they um, all it does is teach you, okay, this move feeds into this move and here's a good transition that's also a defense. So we're gonna, I'm gonna watch the video and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it as we go. Okay, this is Joe Kata, number th 13. He bows in. Let me make this real quick. And stop. Okay, him putting his staff on the ground like that is actually the beginning here. It's a neutral position. When I have taught live in um, writer's workshop, I have what's called a tactical class. And one of the things I show is uh, with weapons of opportunity, I try to get a broom or a mop from the hotel staff. And I start out like that. And I, you know, it, it looks very inert. It looks very neutral, benign. But um, it leads into the first strike. And here we go. One. Okay. The wonderful thing about any staff is the reach that you have on it. And you see how easy it is to take it from a neutral position to a strike position. So here we go. He brings it forward. I believe that's one, two. All right. He brings it up over his head. That is for a defensive position. He is, uh, the assumption is someone's bringing their bow staff down and he is protecting um, his head. He's protecting his chest. And that leads you to a whack. I'm sure there's a better word for it than whack, but that's what it is. But again, you see how he took it from a defensive position and he used the momentum from that defensive position for um, an offensive strike. Boom. He brings it back up for defensive position. Now watch how this leads into another strike. Straight ahead. You wouldn't think it, but straight ahead. Boom. There's another transition, okay? This transition is going to lead into, I believe, an overhand strike. Yep, there it is. Another whack. I wish I knew the correct terminology for it. It can't just be whack. We're going to call it a whack. Okay, again, this is a transition position. It's neutral. It can um, defend the head if he has... A staff coming to the side of his head, but that's all it looks like is his left side. So if he has a staff coming towards his left side on his head, look at how his hands are positioned. He's got one at his hip and then one higher. That makes it a very 
firm uh, grasp and a very stable grasp on the staff. When you hit it, it doesn't fall over in your hands. You've got it supported in the middle and you've got it supported at the base. So if you do take a strike to the tip of the staff, you're good because it's, it's grounded. Well, grounded, what do you call it? It's stable against your body. Another jab. All right, he brings it back. I love this next move. Okay, so you notice that the bottom of the staff is reaching out behind him. He has it stabilized against his body for a sweep. A sweep is when you take someone's feet out from under them. Even if that does not take the feet out from underneath the person, it's going to hit their ankle bone, or you can raise it up to hit the side of their knee pretty hard. And it goes to a strike. Oh. And here's something to notice. Consider how the body moves after it is struck when uh, you are hit in the lower legs. Let's say that it, it doesn't work out as a sweep. If you are hit in the ankle or you're hit in the knee, you're going to bring your head down a little bit and you're probably going to bring your hands down a little bit. Your body may go forward in response to that pain. And look, so look what it's followed up with. Okay, and here we come to a transition. One more jab, and that's it. Okay, so you can see what is offensive and what is defensive. Go back through it and consider what the body is doing when it is struck in the manner that he strikes. Um, consider how that next strike makes the most of the body positioning of the person you're attacking. Um, when you are writing things like this, remember, only write what could be in a cartoon panel, right? I think comic books are fantastic examples for us in writing fight scenes because they only illustrate what's most important. You don't see every tiny little movement in a fight in a comic book panel. You only see what really matters. You will also see the expression on the characters' faces. You may hear um, their utterances. What do you call that? What do you call that when you make a noise like that? I forget. Anyway, you hear oof, you may hear a pow, you hear a crack. So when you have um, comic book panels, they are really trying to make a sensory connection with the reader, and, and that's what you want as well. You want to make a sensory connection. So all the little tiny transitions you see in here and all of those strikes, remember, what would they put in a comic book panel to make the most of the fight scene. They're going to do the large movements. They're only going to describe, describe small movements if they completely change the fight. For example, someone picking, you know, a lock or grabbing something out of their um, back pocket or something. Little movements that change the entire fight and what comes after. So when you are writing um, your um, quarterstaff scene, Arista, remember, would this be in a comic book panel? Okay, and comic book panels are also, they make the most of the space they have. They have a limited amount of space, so they can't use 10 pages for one fight scene. And you probably shouldn't use 10 pages for one fight scene either. Okay, for those of you who want to put any type of staff work um, in your writing, here's a couple little things, little hints. When you are practicing, uh, a lot of times you will, you do practice through katas. They will show you, um, again, because you have to learn how to hold your hand differently as the, as you move the staff around. You do not grip the staff really, really hard. It's very strange. It's a firm grasp, but it's not a white knuckle tight grasp. Um, if you do have a white knuckle tight grasp on it, your hands will really hurt, especially when it's hit hard because that vibration goes up that pole and it, it just, it hurts your hand. That said, uh, one of the things you do is at every position, um, my sensei at least, you hold the position and he comes by and he knocks your pole to see how stable it is. So no matter where the pole is, it should be firm enough that you can hit it but you shouldn't be gripping so hard that you feel um, the vibration of that hit come up to your hands because it really will hurt. It makes your shoulders hurt a lot. You may have some senseis who make you stand in a single position for a long time. You do sometimes, you do hear swishes with um, 
with staffs, those of you who do different types of sword work, especially a lighter sword like a katana, one of the exercises you do is to make the swish, and that's to bring it down quickly in a controlled manner, um, enough that you can stop it where you want to stop it, but fast enough that it makes a swish. You can hear um, a swish with the types of staff we used. I can understand if it's kind of... Um, I can understand where it wouldn't make a swish, but it's completely logical for you to have in your work a little bit. I mean, you're not going to hear a loud whir or anything. When a staff hits against the trunk of the body, it's kind of a, a dead thud sound. It's a little higher pitched when it hits the legs. Um, if the skin, if there's nothing on the skin, I mean, if you have bare skin, you are you do hear a slap. When it hits the head, it makes a crack sound. Um, don't ask me how I know. But also that depends on what the staff is made out of. If it's made with wood, it's going to make one type of sound. If it's made um, with the fiberglass, I have some staffs that are made of, made of fiberglass. And I got to be honest, I don't know how they sound when they hit against the body, but I would think it would maybe be a little bit of a difference, but I, probably not enough that your reader will know. But if you do have readers with um, staff experience, what they are going to look for is um, your character holding it with an iron grip. You don't do that. You don't do that with a sword either. It's um, it's a firm, but it's also a loose grip. Um, they will be looking for, um, if you have a training scene, they will be looking for the sensei to come by and have each fighter hold a certain position in the kata and he'll whack the pole um, to be sure it's firm. But I'll tell you this real quick. Um, I had to do my Joe uh, staff kata number 13 in front of the whole class, which included children. And um, I had not practiced it because that's how I roll. And I did not know what I was doing. And so I stood up there and I counted 13 counts. Um, I was basically freestyling it. It was, I don't know if you're old enough to know Soul Train, but you know, they used to do two lines in Soul Train and one person, would, two people would dance down the middle. That's basically what I was doing. And at the end of the kata, my, I mean, there were people in the class who had their faces in their hands. I'm not even joking. Um, this is a, this wasn't when I was 12. Okay, this was two years ago. My sweet instructor, the kindest man, he, he looked down at his staff that he held in his hand. He kind of nodded. And he said, that was not Joe Kata number 13. But it did look like a kata, which I really appreciated that positivity. And I hope this video helps. Um, I will reach out to some folks who are much better with the staff than I am. And maybe we can get you, um, get you some more examples. Okay, guys. Until then, be sure to check out my book. I've got a book. Got a book. Here we go. Fight Right, How to Write Believable Fight Scenes with Writer's Digest slash Penguin Random House. And be sure to check out my blog at Fight Right, F-I-G-H-T. W-R-I-T-E dot net. I literally forgot there for a minute. Hmm. It's very early in the morning. Until the next round, fight right on YouTube. Get blood on your pages.